Last week, we heard from San Diego Paranormal Eye about their recent investigation of the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas, with some audio evidence that they found. If you haven't heard that episode, I highly recommend going back and listening to that after you hear this one today. Now today, we're going to be concluding the Sally House series with a very special interview of Deborah and Tony Pickman. If you recall, they were the tenants of the house during the 1990s when the TV show Sightings, among many others, first aired some of the paranormal phenomena they were experiencing. This included Tony being scratched to the point of bleeding by unseen forces while the TV crews were filming. I don't want to waste any time getting right to this interview, so here's Deborah and Tony Pickman. So, um, I, first of all, I do want to say thanks again for agreeing to an interview. Um, I've, I've read about you facing a lot of scrutiny in the past and um, that, you know, they're, you're generally private people, so I, I want to say thanks. Um, I, I first heard about you both while watching the TV show Sightings in the mid-1990s. 90, sorry, I can't even say it. 1990s. Um, but I, I don't believe you were, your real names were being used at that time. Um, when did you first move into the house, and how long was it before you started experiencing strange things? Um, we moved in the end of 92. Mm-hmm. Um, our first boy was born in June of 93, so we were, we were pregnant and looking for you know, a nice house when we moved in. And we just we just kind of fell in love with the house. It was ideal. It was what we needed. Yeah, it was a lot bigger than the one we'd left. And just seemed to, you know, when we first moved in, you know, it was pretty quiet. It, it seemed like just a, the right type of house for us, something we could grow into and raise the baby in. So we mm-hmm. were happy to be there. Um, it was probably... A month or so. Yeah, after our son was born. That things... well, no, after we moved in, remember? Oh, that's right. Um, it was before he was born, and <clears throat> we just little things, lights and <clears throat> excuse me, lights and TV the going right. off and on, the ceiling fans we had some trouble with, things that you could kind of rationalize at first, you know, until they started happening over and over and over. I mean, you might get up to go upstairs to the bedroom and have to turn the TV off five, six times in a row. So it it got to the point to where we thought, boy, we either have a really bad electrical problem. And so we called our landlord and he had everything checked out and everything checked out okay. So uh, I think it was when your sister, her sister had come up um, because we weren't getting any sleep. We were, the baby was up all the time and her sister come up to kind of help, you know, relieve some of the pressure there of having a new baby and help kind of. She, Let us I, get some sleep. I think she was thinking new parents. We yeah. had no clue, <laughs> no clue, and she was going to help save the day, and she really did. Yeah. Um, but a lot of what was happening didn't happen while she was there. So we did get sleep. We did get caught up, and it was really nice. But it, it wasn't until the week she left, or I mean the, the last day that she left, that we realized what it was that we'd been dealing with. So, so it, it mainly started out like electrical occurrences that could easily be explained by faulty wiring or just old house. But, but right. I, I guess, how did it escalate into the events that I remember seeing on television? Well, the last night of my sister's uh, visit, we went and got, you know, a bunch of uh, scary movies, and we were just going to make an, an, an evening of it mm-hmm. and put the baby to bed and just hang out and have fun. We'd been gallivanting her out and about with the baby the whole week she'd been there. So we were looking forward to just kicking our feet up and being goofy and silly. But I think, um, like I said, we rented three scary movies, and we were nestling in. Um and when we got home, there was a, um, well, Tony had gone upstairs and come down and asked why we had arranged the bears in a circle. I had gone up to take, I can't remember what it, exactly what it was, but something for the baby back upstairs. And when I walked into the nursery, there was a few, there I am say three, four teddy bears kind of arranged in a circle, or stuffed animals arranged in a circle. And, uh. I thought it was odd because Deb, you know, knowing her, that 
she um she just didn't leave things laying around on the floor. She you know it's put back in its place. So I just assumed that her and her sister had been up there with the baby playing. And I come down to ask them what they were playing, you know, upstairs or why the teddy bears were arranged in such a manner. And they kind of looked at me clueless, like, well, we don't know what you're talking about. So I tried to explain to them. So we all just went upstairs, and here's these teddy bears sitting in a circle. Um, we had actually thought maybe somebody would come into the house and mess. You know, we were looking in closet doors and everything, making sure – you know, none of our friends are over there playing a joke on us. And long story short, we put the teddy bears back. Um, we left the room, and as we were walking out, the light cl- clicked back on. Um, when we turned back around, one of the teddy bears was back on the floor, and we'd put it up on a shelf. Uh, <laughs> it kind of freaked us out, so we put it back again. We went to the all, you know, we were all together to make sure nobody was doing it walked to the bottom of the stairs and we heard the click again and looked upstairs and the light had come back on and when we went back up sure enough there's a teddy bear back on the floor um and this was several feet away from the shelf i mean it, it would have had to have been but i think it was actually a chair right inside the door oh the, the yeah the bear had sat on right at least that one um it, we had checked for magnets and strings and open windows and breezes and yeah I, I have some ornery brothers I thought well sure you know surely <laughs> one of my brothers over here messing around with me or something right so we checked we were checking everywhere um, when we couldn't explain that I think that was the first time that it really kicked in that wow I think you know we There's have something, something really weird in the house going because on. things are being moved now that we can't you know nobody's there to move them and it really kind of sent chills up down our spine we uh did the brave thing and gathered all our movies the dog everything we thought we'd need for the night we all went into dev and i's bedroom and locked the door (laughs) we were safe (laughs) yeah we thought we were safe no ghosts in there yeah i I don't blame you i don't know how i would have reacted um now now you said that the teddy bear moved but did you also notice if the light switch had been thrown no um it didn't seem that there was any reason for that light to have um well oh okay i was thinking in the yeah we, we had noticed that the, the light switch had been thrown that's what we could because we'd hear it click and it'd make us turn around that's when we noticed the light back on so you know both things is just uh you can explain the light just being on but when you actually know you clicked it off and you hear it click back on and then something's moved several feet you know without anyone being there it just it's really kind of creepy yeah it plays a number on you like wow there's there's literally something in here grabbing this thing lifting it up and we all stood in that doorway just kind of mouth agape and just none of us wanting to verbalize what was going on in our head because i think each one of us were thinking oh my god we've got a ghost right now did you um ever get to a point where you visibly saw things move Oh, yeah. 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 Um, that was probably... I'm trying to think what the first one time was. Um, uh, it happens so many times, it's hard to know which one was the first yeah. one. For me, I think the first time I seen something actually move was... Well, it, it, it kind of after that, we would um, we'd go to bed at night. We had several family photos up and down the stairs. Um and you saw a photo move i didn't actually see it move but they were moved i mean i oh yeah would get up in the morning and the pictures would be turned upside down <laughs> hanging upside down um until one was finally broken i think shattered well he asked if you ever saw anything yeah i'm just i'm just trying case. to slowly get to that point it's been oh. so many years i'm trying to get it all together um that's okay i know this is quite a while ago for you yeah like 20 some years <laughs> I, I, there uh this there was a teddy bear downstairs by the TV that <laughs> I That's think that the was one. the first. Yeah. Man, my younger brother had been over, and, you know, he's still kind of a little bit skeptic. And as at this point, you know, your brain tells you you don't want to. I was still, I have to admit, a little skeptic he, myself. Cause, he was very, and you were very still yeah I my brain just didn't want to admit that we had a ghost thing. yeah maybe that's um but we were in the kitchen or not in the kitchen in the living room and we were kind of in a, in a way 
taunting it, I guess you'd say. And if you're here, you yeah, know, get in front We of had the a camera. camera. We were going to take pictures. And my little brother said, all right, Sally, if you're here, uh, let us take your picture. And he was kind of facing the TV about that time. This teddy bear just kind of spun completely around, or a little stuffed animal bear on the, what was it? Yeah, it was a- by the TV right in front of us. And that we were like, <laughs> I remember he just said, I'm out of here. <laughs> and took off um so skeptic no more yeah exactly um I, there was things like a little potpourri thing we had in the kitchen i was there with a friend one time he was laying on the floor and this thing came from the kitchen around a corner and right over his head and hit the wall and it was going fast enough to where the, the house it's an old house so it has the old stucco and you know boards underneath it with the stucco stuff really thick walls um it put a dent in the wall but it did not break the little ceramic dish it just fell and he pretty much did the same thing he jumped up and said i'm out of here we had an oil lamp a uh, neighbor kid was over one day talking to me um all that in the basket telling me about his they, they thought they had something in their house and uh, about that time a oil lamp slid on one of the end tables just slid like somebody just pushed it real fast and <laughs> that freaked us out um i've actually seen the, saw the oil lamp lift up one time probably a good foot in the air and go towards my mother like someone was you know she was holding the baby and she said she the baby reacted like something pinched him and it kind of upset her so she yelled damn it leave this baby alone and this oil lamp just flew off the table towards her, and before it hit her, it just stopped in midair and dropped. Um, and that was because I screamed, I think. Yeah, you called out my it. name, Dad. Yeah. You need to talk to her because you refused to talk to it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Tony didn't. He couldn't grasp or refuse to acknowledge her by actually speaking. Yeah, I didn't want to acknowledge this. we had a ghost of any sort. Right, right. So that always fell in. in he wanted me to look like the fool talking to the ear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did mention the name Sally um, when you were you were speaking to it. Um, how how did that name come into fruition when you were living there? That was probably I think the first time we got the name Sally was we had had when the stuff happened after her sister got there. We um, got in contact with one of my older brothers who's very very logical thinking, very you know level-headed person and we wanted somebody else's opinion and he came over to the house and he had told us that his a boss that he had had a sister that was a psychic um, and she was going to be in town and had offered to get a hold of her and see if you know asked if we'd like her to come over and go through the house and and you know we sure you know we'll try anything at this point um and she was the first one to come up with the name Sally. She told, had told us that she had seen a little girl there. Um, the little girl's name was Sally. And that was a, she, that's kind of why you did a lot of your talking to the ghost, because she kind of suggested to. Yeah, she suggested um, because she was, she was, it was communicated to her that this little girl ghost was seven years old her name was sally um some of the ailments that she had lived with in her life um you know a couple different things the things that she liked to play with in the house and she basically told me that i needed to communicate with this spirit and tell her no you can't you know play with this or um you can't wake the baby you know things like that kind of treat her as if she were right there and you know Tony and I, I can remember us looking at each other, I, saying, at this "How do you? Point, I how thought do you she was nuts. discipline? I mean. <laughs> you know, something you can't see." Um, and yeah, you know, talking to the air was going to be a new kind of <laughs> endeavor. Um, but it was, it was what we thought we had to do to to work through the problems that we were having. You know, we were. Uh, the baby was being woken up. Um, I don't remember. I'm trying to remember. I don't think we did have fires starting at that time. Not, not at that point. Well, 
No, I take that back. Because we did have, like in the oil lamp, they opened oh, the little, right. opened yeah, the little had, candle light, tea was, light yeah, flames. Because that was one reason the psychic suggested we kind of talk to her to tell, to her, tell no. her, no, you don't don't be lighting fires, don't be right. doing if, this. You know, if you're here to protect the baby, then... That could, yeah. yeah. That could be bad for the whole house. You know, we could all go up in flames. Um so it was it was a real interesting um, guy. I think she was there probably an hour and a half, two hours easily. Mm-hmm. Her and her sister, and it was definitely enlightening. There was a, a point where we had gone upstairs and to the nursery, and she felt you know like a real heaviness and heart. Yeah, she breathe. started holding her chest and breathing real heavy, and she told us she more or less said, "We need to get out of here." There's too, too many in here. She doesn't like us in here right now. And I was holding a camera at this time. And we started leaving the room, and she had told me to take a... Uh, she said, she's right there, told me to take a photograph. Well, when I, I turn around, I'm not seeing anything, but I went ahead and took the photograph. But something did show up in the photograph, so she, you know, <laughs> pretty neat. Wow. Yeah, it was- it was kind of like a murky streak of a blob kind of going up the stairs. It's It's been seen online a lot. Um, There's one coming out of the room and then one as we're standing at the bottom of the stairs. Um, okay. Now, now, with her advice for, you know, you telling, basically telling Sally that she's not allowed to do certain things or any, any requests or demands that you made, did, did you feel like there was compliance? <laughs> It was hard to, to to know. I mean, how, you discipline something you can't see. How do you know it's actually taking place? You know, go to your room. Right. Um, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was hard to. I mean, m- there were times when things would seem a little calmer. I mean, you you would go weeks without anything happening. So you're thinking, okay, it's actually working a little bit. But then, boom, something else would happen. You know, just out of the. And it, it might be anything from a little fire again till, um, you know, things had started to escalate within what? Probably well, within the month. Yeah, and then it escalated to the point where we didn't know what we were talking to because it wasn't like a little girl was doing the things that were. Yeah, you know, things they, started happening that to me, I, I remember thinking, "There's no way this could be a little girl." What? little girl at that age would think to do this stuff and i mean it, you know some from pretty outrageous fires to the scratching um and and just feelings you'd get it, there were times when you'd have some really at least i would um really angry feelings while, while i was there um it was just like a, an, an anger would come over you uh, where you just uh, you felt like you either wanted to hurt someone or, or, or just uh, be really violent. Um, I couldn't explain that, and it just didn't feel like a little girl. Well, you've, you've said a lot of things that I have questions about. Um, but, but going back to the fires, um, what types of things would catch fire? Normally, it was uh, it, we had the teddy bear by the TV a couple times. Um, oil lamp would just uncontrollably get really the the fire would just you know different candles we had tapir candles in sconces on the wall that tony didn't notice until you know one day probably well after they had been lit up and like tea lights you know the little tiny little tea lights Mm -hmm. Uh, the baby's binky come flying across the room i forgot about that one yeah, we had friends over for a it was a birthday party, mm-hmm. and uh, we were all sitting around the table, and, and all of a sudden this light comes streaking kind of across the floor, um, and we didn't know what it was. Uh, one of the friends looked under the table, and here's we had a pacifier that had it was like a thermometer, thermometer inside baby. it to take a baby's temperature, and it had been burnt. I mean, just black and, and shrill. The ears on the rocking horse? Yeah, we had a little wooden rocking horse with kind of leather ears um, on it. A mop doll at Christmas time. I mean, it was it was definitely an array of things. It wasn't like it was only the baby's things that were a lit. 
or you know only tony's things yeah it was an it, array it of things kind of got to the point you just never knew what was and I, I know i was always in fear i'm thinking if it's lighting this fires what's to keep it from lighting. setting us on fire or you know the biggest concern was our baby you know what <laughs> i don't right. want to you know yeah that's that would be definitely the hugest concern um I do want to kind of talk about the the scratches that you experienced. Um, mm -hmm. And that, to me, that was one of the most alarming things I'd ever seen. And at that point, I, I believe I was um, nearly out of high school. Uh, but it, it just it really Way to blew go. my mind. Date us. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's it's dating yeah. me too. <laughs> um, you know, I think I was a, a junior in high school, and and I just remember watching that on the show, and it's like. I, f I thought to myself, how could that be faked? You know, you're sitting there watching these welts pop up and then blood start coming out of it. And I guess I always wondered, you know, Tony, can you describe the sensation you felt when that occurred? I can. There, there were times when I didn't feel anything. They would literally, someone would literally have to point it out to me because I had no idea. But there were times when, and it happened so much that I got to where I knew it was happening. Um, it would be an intense cold and the closest way I could figure it, it would feel like almost like an icicle going through you, you know, not that I've had an icicle go through me, but it was that cold, just a really intense cold feeling that would shoot through you. And usually when I felt that I'd almost 90% of the time I knew, I, you know, I was being scratched. Um, I can only, there was probably five or six times when I got a scratch where it actually at times felt like a, a bad bee sting. Um, and then probably about three times it felt like someone really punched the hell out of me. It, uh, I remember one time being interviewed by, a, um, I think it was sightings and I was holding the baby standing in the doorway of the kitchen and it just felt like somebody kidney punched me as hard as I could and I almost dropped the baby I screamed out and I was like oh and kind of my knees you know buckled mm -hmm. and luckily I kind of fell into the wall um and sure enough I had they we couldn't determine if it was a cross or a x and it was a pretty good cut on my back yeah it was um enough to it really scared the crew they had me they took me out of the house you know made me go over to the neighbors for a while until things kind of lightened up yeah i remember um, when your knees buckled one of the guys grabbed the baby mm -hmm. because they thought you were going down um but the biggest sensation i would say to relate scratches was was just a, an, an icy cold wow you, you wouldn't think that you know you, you think scratches you'd, you'd feel heat or you know some mm -hmm. abrasion kind of thing but, but cold doesn't seem like it would fit now, now deborah what was what was going on in your mind as you were witnessing all this you know, uh, I'm very disturbed looking back because my logical self, my caring self, it it, it wasn't there. Um, and, and Tony and I have, have talked about it and we're, we have a much better understanding of the house and what it was doing to each of us now than we did back then. Um, I definitely wasn't myself and I honestly when you ask when anybody asks questions like that it's to me it's emotionally overwhelming because I didn't have much of a feeling about it at the time I she never asked questions that's what was so puzzling um, I mean she's, she's a very gotta know type person mm -hmm. and when it was happening, it was just kind of like, okay, do do do. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I know for myself. So times I was thinking, you know, I would get to a point where I thought she doesn't care, um, but she was just so out of character. Um, it was just kind of almost nonchalant for you. I mean, you were just like, oh well. It looks you know, like it, it didn't phase me. And um, at the same time, I'm fighting feelings of, you know. <laughs> You talked about how it would scare you. It scared the hell out of me. I, all I could think of was, you know, I'm, this is the exercise or exorcist type stuff. I'm physically being scratched and, and 
you know, what's next? It, it, and I fought with the, you know, trying to understand why she didn't see. I, I mean, I know now, but back then it was uh, it was really confusing. Um, yeah. Why she couldn't understand what was going on. I, oh, so, it is hard to say. Part of me thought that when he, because he he worked second shift, mm-hmm. which meant or second or third shift. Both. It, yeah, um, I thought he I thought he had a lack of of rest, lack of sleep, and I thought you know that in turn was playing tricks with his mind and. Um, I just I I didn't put I didn't put forth the effort to try and understand things from his point of view, and like Tony said, that's that's not like me not to ask questions, a million questions to try and figure out you know what was going on. And I think a lot of your having the baby, your motherly instinct mm-hmm. was kicking in. So the whole idea of having another little child in the house, she was almost embracing it. Um, you know, kind of, uh, how do you say, almost welcoming it, like <laughs> treating it like like we had two children almost. Which, if you think about the the end result, you know, that, that what we were dealing with was evil, um, it, it, it had me, it, I welcomed it in, in really easily, really quickly because of that motherly instinct of, taken care of and oh you poor little you know what's easier to pull someone in other than you know an innocent little girl and so it had me at at, at day one wow now now tony were you the only person who experienced uh physical attacks like that no i was (laughs) unfortunately the one that the cameras went towards i mean you know, because I was I'd gotten scratched on camera, so it kind of skyrocketed from there. But every I think it was every member of um, the sightings the team. sightings crew had something physical happen to them. They would leave there just kind of in awe, and they would go back and tell their people back. You know, at the studio, said, "Man, you've got to come up here. You won't believe this." And they bring more, and you know, more stuff would happen to them. Um, Everything from the cold, cold spots they'd feel. You know, they they take temperatures from it'd go from 82 to 32 in just a, you know, little softball sized spot. <laughs> it was crazy. Some of them would have electrical, feel like they were being shocked, um, touched. Uh, there were a couple scratches, slight ones on people. Um, it was it was so, um, it happened so often and. It had people in such awe that Tim White, which was the show's host, we got him really curious. He'd never been out in the field, not to my knowledge. Um, and he came out to the house to experience what everybody else had been experiencing. So it was... And he was he was still a little skeptical after being there until well, I, I was talking to him this? in the kitchen one, one in between filming there and... All of a sudden, his eyes got big, and, and he just looked at me, and he said, something's being scratched on your forehead right now. And I can't even remember what it – it was almost like a word was being scratched on my forehead while I was talking to him. And from that point on, he was like, if there's anything we can do to help you, we will. <laughs> Promise. Because he'd, he'd never seen anything like that before. How about for you, Deborah? Was Was there anything that you experienced like that? Um – not anything to the physical extent. Well, I can't say that either. Not to the physical harm. I uh, There were times where I was sitting with the baby and, come on, let's go uh, read a book. And then I would invite Sally to come sit with us. And, you know, I'd sit down on the floor Indian style and baby on one knee. And I would feel a distinct coldness on the other knee. I mean, significantly, like like my knee was stuck in a freezer or something. I mean, that distinct. Um, There were times, and quite often, actually, I would say almost every time I went upstairs with the baby, would feel a distinct coldness 
uh, like run past me or whoosh past me Mm -hmm. as if, you know, big sister was racing up the stairs to get to the baby's room before us. I remember that feeling. Yeah. (laughs) We, we would hear a lot of times when we'd go to bed at night, it would, you would hear something running up and down the steps. Um, to the point, you know, we had a few cats and I would always, I'd be cussing the cats all the time. Like, God, damn cats running up and down them steps. He went out one night. And I went out one night and I said, I'm (laughs) going to scare them. So they quit doing it. And as I got to the top of the stairs, I, I literally heard a little girl giggling and I felt that cold that she's feeling just rush by me and, and almost, I, I swear to God, it moved my hair. I mean, you could feel it that much. Um, yeah, it still, I still get chills thinking about that. Now, you guys have been married for a long time now, and I remember what it's like to have a newborn around. You're just, you're exhausted all the time. You're worn out. Um, would you say all these events hindered your marriage or ultimately maybe made it stronger? At that time, it was really... Um, can't say hindering, but I was changing. Um, <laughs> I know we it's argued so hard to every time sightings came up. Yeah, we would distinctly because arguing. It would seem like for me, it would seem like things would escalate every time they came up. And at this point, it you know, it kind of like it, it didn't feel like we were getting help to get rid of it. And at this point, I don't. I'm not sure Deb even wanted to. No. Get rid of it. And so we would fight like cats and dogs. Um, and then it got to the point where you were you were being attacked um, on a mental level, where things were being put into his head about me, you know, and his feelings were changing about me. And I so, was having horrible harms I, or feelings of wanting to harm her when she would walk by me in a room. It would just be like an instant. My mood could go from happy to where I just, as soon as she walked by me, all I could think was I just wanted to reach out and choke her or, you know, I didn't want her there. It, it was, um, it got to a point where I didn't feel like myself while I was in the house. It, it literally felt like a whole different personality because I'd leave the house and it would just be like, you know, it's almost like you could breathe again. And then as soon as I'd get home, it was just this heavy, uh, my mood would change to just. So it eventually um, got worse quickly to the point where we were not, we were not a unit. We were not a, a loving unit. It, had, it basically played divide and conquer. We were, we were against each other, point to where... Um, we viewed things differently. Um, we behaved differently. We behaved to each other differently. We thought differently. You know, it yeah. was, and it was an argue argument a lot of the time. So, I mean, it probably wasn't, but six months to a year into living in that house where. We were not as there was in love so much, as, yeah, yeah. There was so much tension in the house that it, I mean, you, you could you could cut it with a knife. It, it was horrible. Well, how did your friends and family respond to everything that was going on? Our friends, they were always, you know, it, it start off. They they would want to come over, you know, because they'd hear about oh, you know, we want to experience something. We want to. But then when something would happen, it'd be like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we're out of here. Um, my family in particular, you know, we were brought up, you know, pretty much Roman Catholic, Irish Catholic. And you just, they didn't want to talk about it. It was just nothing I brought up around them. Um, it made them very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable, yeah. Uh, and, my family tended... Um, they were a little bit more open and maybe because they were there, like my sister and my mother were actually um, present when some of these, these things were happening. And, you know, maybe that had a little bit more to do with 
their acceptance of it. Yeah, they were actually, you know, one few of the people that we could talk to about it. Um, I think they still had quite a bit of reserve about it, you know, not finding it hard to understand how something, you know, like this activity could happen. But, I mean, in the end, they didn't they didn't come right out and say, you know, you're full of crap. Uh, they, they, they were really understanding about our, our position and, you know, felt for us. At the same time, I'm sure they wondered, why don't you, as, as many people do, why didn't you just leave? And it, it goes back to, we were money wise, we were just not in the shape to. Right. We had dumped um, everything we had into the deposits and everything for utilities and, you know, new curtains and you know, just getting into the house and making things comfortable. And it's hard to do that. And then, you know, have new baby expenses on top of that. So it was hard to just turn around and, you know, start all over again and find a different place. And, and like I said, there were times when you, you could go weeks to a month without anything happening and you would start to think, okay, you know, we were either imagining it or or. <clears throat> You know, it's gone now. We don't have to worry about it anymore. And then out of the blue, it, it would just come back. And it seemed like every time it would happen again, it was twofold. I mean, it came back twice as hard. So it just it got really hard to deal with. What was the, I guess, the breaking point for you or, or what opportunity presented itself for um, a, an opportunity to move out of the house? Well, I think the breaking point was and I, I can't answer for Deb, but for me it was, I had one day woke up and literally all I could think of was planning on hurting her when she came home. Go um, ahead, say it. I, I had went as far as I had a knife setting out. I, I planned yeah. on, you know. Planned on killing me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was that morning I remember coming out of the bedroom in the morning and something hit me from behind it's like it come up and just i don't know if it went into me or what but it come in just right th through my back and with enough force to throw me forward and into the railing and stare and i think it knocked out three rungs of the railing um how that, how does that, that conversation come up i mean obviously you've discussed it with her but how, how did you bring that up with her it had been there, and I think I, find, I don't know if I just had enough, the look of fear in my eyes that evening, or I had gone to my parents that day just to, to take the baby over, and I'm, I'm so thankful I did because... Actually, to pick up. Yeah, or to pick the baby up because my mother was watching. Um, I was able to get a clear head after that. So had I not done that, I, I'd hate, I shudder what would have happened that evening when Deb got home. And he told me about knocking the railings out of the this, this stairway. He didn't, I didn't learn about the whole. Yeah, at this point I was too scared to tell her what I was feeling, what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. But something must have been, some godly effect, some angel effect must have been shining on us because it was, and I, 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 I really have no explanation for it, but that was the day that you know when he when he told me he was shoved and, and the railings got knocked out for some reason that's when it it hit me that we need to move this yeah is I, couldn't, I couldn't dangerous. believe it because she just looked at me and, and finally agreed she's like yeah I, I think you're right if, if you're that concerned about it we, we need to go I mean it, it it wasn't like it hadn't been brought up before his mother had brought it up he'd brought it up several times you know we well, we argued over it. I don't know how yeah. many times you know it was always, but she always had a way of talking me out of it um, but for some reason that I you know I can't explain it but for some reason it just it clicked in her that that day that we need to get out and it was what we moved within like a week or a so. week I believe it was after that. Wow, that I I would be out probably as a lot sooner than you. So credit to you for <laughs> sticking around. Well, when as you long say as you... that, Tony said the same thing. Uh huh. Like we had discussions before even moving into that house, you know, about ghosts and you know just in 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 conversations, watching TV shows and and you know I remember him saying, 
I would never stay in that situation. I would be out of there in a heartbeat. You'd never get me to stay. And, and what's weird, had she not agreed that day, I think it would have, because I had gotten to the point where I was changing and instead of wanting to leave, I, I almost got to the point where I didn't want to leave anymore. It was, um, it, it was more, I wanted her gone out of the picture. And that, that's what it was getting to. And it could have been it, it could have gotten very very bad had we stayed much longer than we did yeah now some some people believe that ghosts or spirits are actually demonic entities masquerading as uh, people um, do you believe that's the case with Sally or anything else that might be there absolutely um, just if, if you look at how the progression of the events changed the the presentation you know, you know Tony saw this little Sally girl you know innocent young spirit you know your heart goes out to her um, that's the easiest way to get somebody to believe or to accept from from what welcome. we've learned now is a lot of times your demonic demonic spirits will present themselves as children. And I, I think it's a way because most most adults aren't that scared of children, and can are more accepting of a child, and so you, you they'll tend to welcome it more in, into their their home, um, or it'll come as a child and become a play friend for you know another child or vice versa. Um, Deb welcomed it for me. It just scared the hell out of me when I saw the little girl in the kitchen. Um, so it moved on to so presenting kind of to Tony in a different manner. Yeah, I would, I, there was twice I can think of top of my head I, upstairs, I would see this woman dressed in 18th century clothing, but it would be Deborah. I would see her dressed like that. Oh, wow. um, I'd be in the bathroom and I'd see her walk past the doorway. Um, I'd go out to find her, go into the room it walked into, nothing. I'd go around the corner and there's Deb completely, you know, not in that outfit, you know, <laughs> her hair all down, uh, you know, just completely like she'd just gotten out of the shower herself. Um, That's really interesting because I, I just spoke with, um, I don't know if you've listened to these episodes, but I, I spoke with Denise Pridemore as well as um, San Diego Paranormal Eye, who was there in October doing an investigation. They, they both uh, visibly saw someone in the same time same type of you know 18th century period clothing but it was a much older woman um yeah <laughs> yeah i can i can totally relate to that because after i'd seen that apparition it finally started showing itself to me as an older woman and i i can see it like it was yesterday um this this woman would show up on my side of the bed um wearing it was 18th century clothing. It was a long black dress, kind of with a high collar. I can even remember the brooch she had on. Um, long sleeves, and she had lace gloves, and looked very grouchy. I, I, I always refer to her as the store owner's wife off of the little house on the prairie. She, <laughs> she, that's kind of what she looked like to me. And she would come around to my side of the bed, and I would just be, oh my god. <laughs> I almost paralyzed because I, I was just so scared and I just remember her reaching out for me and this happened twice and she'd reach for my throat and as she did I would hear the words I'm gonna like she was shouting at me she'd say I'm gonna and then I would see this big like a crow show up on her hand and then she'd disappear um so yeah, I can I can totally relate to the older woman. So, question for both of you: um, How have your religious beliefs been influenced since you've lived in the house? <laughs> Skyrocketed. <laughs> yeah. I I can't tell you what it's done for me, um, because that's all I had. That's all I really felt like I had. It was at the time this stuff was happening to us. The paranormal was not big like it is now. It was, um, you might have had one, maybe two shows on about the paranormal. So it was nothing you could just go to work and talk about, or, yeah. I, we literally, I literally felt totally alone. The internet wasn't real big 
back then either where you could just jump on the internet and find, you know, a group to come and help you. Mm -hmm. And all I could think to do was pray to God that please don't, you know. Because I wasn't there for him either. He couldn't tell me these things because I would just kind of blow him off. So the the things that he was experiencing, he was going through them pretty much all alone. And the things I was seeing to me were evil. I'd, I'd seen the little girl change into something one night when I was seeing her that I still to this day can't explain. It was half human, half animal, kind of rotted. Oh, I call a demon. That's to me what a demon would look like. Um, and it let out a roar at me that still sends chills down my spine when I think about it. Um, but to see that kind of evil, I, I know that there's, there's a heaven now. I mean, that's, that's as good as I can put it. It really restored my faith actually. And being, you know, involved significantly with the paranormal since then, whether, you know, it be just talking about our experiences or the investigations that we, the extreme investigations that we went on afterwards, the, the situations that we were in, I, I became very um, attuned to how there had to have been some sort of heavenly intervention in some of these situations for them to have rectified themselves the way they did. I mean, there, there was no doubt in my mind, so my my faith was definitely bolstered i've been brought up you know baptized brought up catholic and all but i had kind of veered away from that over the years Mm -hmm. and you know i'm not a holy roller you know where i'm going to try and get somebody to change their religion i will definitely stand on a soapbox and and tell you that in my life God has definitely made a difference, and I have seen his work, and I I do wholeheartedly believe in him and, and the ability that he has to protect us, and I think that that is what has kept us together as a couple. And I, I think that's the, the one great thing that's come out of what happened to us was it our, our faith has, like, totally been restored. Well, I, I think I need to pause and just, you know, reflect on that for a moment. I mean, you should be applauded for... Uh, sticking together and, and becoming stronger through all of that stuff that you experience. Um, have you, I guess, bef- after you left the house, but before you started diving into paranormal investigation, had you experienced anything additional? We we didn't for like the first, what, was it 11 months? No, it no, was sure than that. Yeah, it was like two months. It two was... months. We moved out in October, and by this, well, early January when my brother came. Yeah, her, her brother had come up for a visit, and it was the first time I'd met her brother and, and his wife. And um, we, No, really? Yeah. And we were sitting down to dinner that night, and I, you know, that cold I had told you about, I started feeling that all around my stomach. And I thought, oh, no. So I kind of excused myself and called Deb into the little we had a little room off the kitchen and i said i'm feeling that cold again but i was scared to say anything from her brother i didn't know how he would react to any of it and being the first time i'd met him i didn't want to you know ruin his perception of me um so deb had me lift my shirt sure enough i had that's where i got the love i had like 11 scratches across my stomach um totally freaked me out because to this point i was still under the impression that If a house was haunted, it was the house that was haunted. Um, It stayed at the house. Once you left, you were good to go. Totally, totally freaked me out. I I remember being in a panic, and I had contacted Carrie Gaynor, who was a... um, Parapsychologist. Yeah, very well-known one. He was the one that was involved in the cases, the entity and the... uh, poltergeist Mm -hmm. um and i called him and he had been a huge help for me uh during the whole sightings deal and he um you know i I said carrie i I don't live there anymore i said we we were just sitting down for dinner and i said i've got these scratches showing up again and i just remember he paused and he said i was afraid of that i'm like what afraid of what and he said well 
sometimes you'll have a, a haunting that will get personal and can become attached to you and can follow you. And he said, you may live with this the rest of your life. You know, it may just up and stop here. Um, so <laughs> at, at first time I, I'd really realized that a haunting, especially a, a demonic type haunting, um, doesn't just stay in one spot. What ultimately led to the decision to go public about your experiences? <laughs> the need for help. Sightings was offering, yeah, um, bringing in you know people in the field, which we didn't feel we personally had any access to. So we thought um, that we were going to get some help. They'd say we can bring this person in, and they can help you with this and that. Okay, yeah, and they did bring in paranormal investigators and parapsychologists and. <clears throat> Um, people that and, and Peter James, you know, big on the haunting aspect of of things. You know, they they definitely tried their best to bring in people that could shed some light on on our situation. And I, I think they probably helped us more on a personal note than they did or understanding. Well, I think just walking away knowing that we weren't the only ones seeing this or experiencing this was helpful not that they were able to give us answers but then i don't know if anybody could have given the given the answers that we wanted we still don't have answers to this day you feel like you got some level of validation though yes. yeah that, yes. that was probably the biggest for me it was i was always scared that you know if, for me it probably would have been worse if they'd come up and nothing happened because then I, i'd have felt like i mean it was not an easy decision to come out, especially on television. I grew up in this town. My, you know, Pickmans are everywhere. My parents did a wonderful job of, you know, making a good name for for us. And I did not want to be the one to ruin that or look like the crazy Pickman or his his mom and dad each had thirteen, fourteen siblings apiece. Mm -hmm. Tony came from a family of eight, so Pickmans are everywhere. Or, or <laughs> The relation to Pikmins are everywhere in our small town. And to come out and ruin the, you know, the respect that people had for the family was Tony's worst, worst fear. So that, that was one reason we, we did the, <coughs> we had our names, you know, they said, well, we can, when we come up, we can kind of blur you out and, you know, do this and that because people won't know you, we'll change your names. Well, you know, I would go into work and everybody would say, Man, we could tell that was you. You know, <laughs> it was. We were finding out more and more. It really didn't help. People knew who we were. They recognized the house. They recognized, you know, the people that we cared about. Anyway, you know what they thought. So, uh, we kind of made the decision. You know, there's why do that? Everybody knows it's us now. Anyway, so. So we did eventually. And and you get to, you know, we got to where we could trust the crew that was coming up and stuff like that. And at that point too, when we did come out we realized that there were more people that were accepting or curious about our situation rather than taunting and, and making it, you know, a big farce and, you know, something to poke fun at and, you know, disrespect. So it, it, it worked out. Now there's been just a, a ton of different TV shows featuring the Sally house. Um, some even pretty recently, do you believe they're accurately representing the facts about your story and, and the historical accounts there? They to, try to, to an yeah. extent. You have to, I think, some extent, because your public demands entertainment, they have to... Oh, they have your... to be creative in how they, they use the facts to make sure that it is entertaining. Um and not because it's not in itself, but to tell our story that took two years in a 45-minute episode, you have to kind of go through everything and, and the scenario of, of how everything ties together changes a bit. So there is, there is some level of creative liberty in there, and you've got to kind of expect, or we've grown to expect it. Almost every um, depiction of our story other than what has been told in our own words um, through th things like my ghost story and stuff, 
has pretty much, you know, been at, at the liberty of how they want to produce it, you know, how they want to present it, you know, how they understand it. Yeah, you can, you it. can tell your story, but that's about all the all that you can do. <laughs> you tell your story and you hope for the best that they, they present it. Yeah, because you don't you don't get um, creative Liberty, rights yeah, to, to say, oh, you know, that's not how it happened or we don't like the way that was, you know, shown or you don't get anything like that. And that was, that was probably our biggest reason for writing the book was to make sure we got our... That or write then, facts across that and radio interviews like with you we we get you know to give everybody firsthand experience um, details people get to ask questions that have been lingering you know that, you know others may be you know a little unwary to want to ask but eventually they do get asked so and that's that's a good question you ask because we do get asked that a lot it's like um you know, they they've seen because someone's seen this happen on TV. They'll they'll get a hold of us and say, "Did that really happen, or is that how it happened?" So it, it's good to to do these shows like this. And well, I certainly appreciate it. Um, you you did mention your book, um, and I'm I'm assuming you're referring to the the Sally House Haunting: A True Story. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like to quote a little section from the preface, um, and it says this this book will challenge what we've been told for years. <clears throat> excuse me, and confront what we think we know about spirits and the activity they so supposedly engage in. What do you think are some of the most common misperceptions people have today about paranormal activity? Well, I think, like Tony said, you know, a haunting doesn't follow you. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a location that's haunted, and if you leave, you're fine. And that's not the case. There's, you know, you can be at a haunted location, and a spirit gravitate to you it doesn't have to necessarily be an evil spirit you know just a spirit for that for some reason gravitates to your your energy or your your aura or you know something of of that sort they can attach to you and become attachments um hang out with you for a day an afternoon a, a week or a month and and then just tootle along um there's there doesn't seem to be any um rules they kind of go where they want to go and a lot of times i would imagine people don't even know that they're around um that's that's one um the concept that they have unfinished business i'm not really sure that is um true i mean spirits hang back for probably several reasons you know maybe they just weren't ready to go and and i think three one they're they're not always spirits right (laughs) you have some demonic activity out there that can present itself as a loved one it can present itself as a you know as a child is in in many different forms um and i think that happens a lot more than yeah more than than people realize and they think they're befriending, you know, Grandma Jane, and you know it's a dark entity trying to gain acceptance so that it can wreak more havoc within that environment. And the fact that you know when you see your paranormal shows, you you see their story, and they they can convey certain feelings of the people that are going through it, the the being scared, the you know some of the traumatic things, but there's so much that goes on. Be behind that that um, I know for myself just <laughs> it's the feelings you have that you can't you can't explain um, the, the mood changes the the oppression the, the intense the, feeling of loneliness yeah being oppressed um, knowing to, that you're having feelings or thoughts that aren't yours yeah almost to feelings of being possessed and that's what that's what mine had led to where I felt like I was not in control of myself a lot um, to the to guilt feelings of guilt for you know you, you, you blame yourself for even moving there <laughs> I know I did um, 
there's just a lot that goes on that you don't realize comes along with a haunting of, of this, that you say, um, nature. Or, right. And I don't think that um, people realize, you know, when, when people hear the word poltergeist, we had a lot of poltergeist activity in the house, but we didn't have a teenager in the house. Um, and that is one big concept that that people believe in. Um, I think it's it's just a very heightened emotional state that can cause the poltergeist activity. It's a it's a chemical Im- um, imbalance per se um, that can create that poltergeist scenario. It doesn't have to just be you know a, a teenager, you know, going through the puberty. I mean, true, they have that chemical imbalance, and maybe you know the majority of of what poltergeist activity when that's been seen has you know been attributed to a, a teenager in the house but it doesn't always have to be and I, I think that that is a new concept that people have have begun to understand over the you know the, the latter, latter years here well I, I think it's important to note too that going back to what you previously said about your very first experience um, you know emotions weren't high when you had that teddy bear experience you weren't even sure anything was really going on so you're mm-hmm. having that activity before anyone reaches that emotional level. Right. Yeah. Now, now you, you've, you've both been back to the house since you moved out. Um, what, what got you to go back? And I guess what experience, if any, uh, did you have while you were there? I was the first to go back to the house. Uh, we would have investigative groups contact us and want to, visit with us to see what we, what our experiences truly were in the house and you know they had already planned on you know the investigation so when they left the visit with us after we had you know expounded on the the experiences we had it was like we were best of friends and they would invite us to go with them and I would jump at the chance um, what I learned from that probably was was more about investigating um, you know, in general, and you know the equipment and stuff like that, because I can't say that we I, I got the answers I was looking for as far as why or what, you know, pertaining to the house and the the events that took place there. Um, for me, it took it took a lot longer. I think I stayed away for close to ten years. Yeah. Um, tried to not even drive by the house. Um, but the more Deb got into investigating. Um, you know, we would, this would, it almost turned into almost an every weekend thing. Our friends would come up or group would come up and they'd go over and investigate. Well, I started kind of, one, I would, they would come back with some amazing evidence, um, EVPs, the voices that have been captured over there are just amazing. And so many children voices, um, I would hear all this stuff and I, I literally, it almost, I want to say, tricked me. It was like I started thinking, well, maybe there are spirits there and they do need help. Well, you started second guessing your yeah, own intuition. I, yeah. Exactly. I started second guessing things and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it won't be that bad. So I would go over and occasionally I would get scratched. Um, well, there was one particular group that kind of. Um, that you kind of gravitated to and maybe this was at the height of you saying well you know this the whole second guessing thing yeah and it was a group out of kansas city and they'd been to the house several times so they had an array of evps to to present to us and i think that is when you decided well yeah i'll i'll and, go over and, with and you and like deb said we be, you know you become friends with these people and good friends and i trust them in my life so I got brave enough and decided to go in and things would happen but nothing you know I th- scratching would be the worst but by at this point you know I was so you know, used to a couple to hours it. would turn into you know the whole night you know over the course of time and without anything happening and yeah so, and then there were times I'd go over and nothing would happen so I would think I'm in the clear um, <laughs> then I think it was probably what 2007 
August 17th, 2000, uh, August 18th, 2007. And, and mind you, I, I have, ever since leaving there, I have a tremendous pull back to that house. It, I literally have to fight going back. Um, so much so, Jeremy, that I've woke up in the middle of winter barefoot. I've walked from our, our house, which is nine blocks, mm-hmm. about nine blocks away, in my bare feet over there and wow. woke up sleepwalking standing in the front yard um so it, it's a constant fight to not go back um but 2007 we went back and we were in there earlier in the day and it seemed pretty light i mean we had a we walked around with some equipment took photos stuff like that nothing super bad happened out of the ordinary no you weren't a, you yeah weren't we weren't that affected or... so <clears throat> we felt safe going back later that night and we should have known we pulled up and a fellow investigator thought as soon as we pulled up they saw something dark get up out of a chair and walk past a window should have been our first hint um but we went in anyway we were, as soon as you walked in it was it was just a total different feeling there very was, heavy and yeah heavy. it was hard to breathe there was a heaviness in the house and we should have once again turned around and left but instead, we took some equipment upstairs. I was walking around with the camera. I think Deb had a smudge stick. She was kind of going around, you know, or sage stick, yeah, I had going from room to room, saying <clears throat> prayers. Um, I had saged the house in the first trip and was, you know, saging the second trip because of the, yeah. the trepidation that we were feeling. She was in the master bedroom, and I stepped in the door with the camera, and I was just kind of taking po- photos of nothing in particular, just taking photos. As soon as I walked in the bedroom, I got an intense, sick feeling, just um, dizzy, really nauseated, and I was just standing there trying to catch my bearings, and boom, it, it just... I saw it. I, I, it felt I, like I got hit by a car. I, um, I was in the room, and I had just about turned around to see him lift like, oh, eight to ten inches off the floor and slammed the wall. And... It, it hit me hard enough to where I had laced up steel, steel-toed boots on. I'd come from work, and it it left my boot where I was standing and knocked me out of my boot into the wall, um, pretty much knocked me unconscious. When I came to, I just remember Deb kind of on the side of me, and she was crying, and, and, you know, Tony, are you all right? Are you all right? And... I tried to sit up, and it just felt like something slammed me back to the floor. It felt like an elephant had my freaking shoulders and slammed me to the floor. It looked floor. like something was holding him down. And <clears throat> I was just paralyzed with fear. I mean, I, <laughs> I I just kept trying to get up, but it wouldn't let me get up. Um, other investigator with us come around the corner and, I believe, yelled, in the name of Jesus Christ, let him go. Nothing happened. The second time she yelled it, it just it released me. And I was able to get up, and we pretty we much... shuffled him out the door, yeah. grabbed our equipment, and left. Um, but when we left, we were filled with the anxiety, you know, of what had just happened. And because our kids were still young, we didn't want to come right back home and let them see us in that state. So we drove to the river, which was just, you know, it was like four blocks up and one block in. And yeah. while we're in the car, I'm just, my skin's just on fire. I'd felt like I, I'd been burnt all over and was telling Deb about it. I took my shirt off and, oh my God, I had. <laughs> he had like 50 some scratches on the front or back and then 30. Yeah, there the were so or... many scratches from head to toe. I'm, I'm yeah. talking everywhere wow. that I couldn't, I couldn't scratch. And some were pretty severe. I mean, I was, um, and I don't know how you explain it. I mean, that all happened within 10, 15-minute time span. Yeah, we hadn't been in the house very long. <clears throat> and I think that was the last time until, was it? Ghost Adventures. Ghost Adventures came up. Right. And I'd went in there for a little while. Was that, they didn't let me stay in long. And I was, I was totally fine with that because I really, I'd, I'd had... It was kind of a last-minute thing to go in for a little bit. We were basically trying an experiment. Um, 
and they brought in a psychic and kind of wanted to see if she would pick up more while I was there. Um, but once again, we were in the basement um, and felt like something grabbed the back of my neck really hard, kind of hit kind of kind of between my head and my neck, the bottom of my head and my neck. And I just remember at the same time I did that, the psychic that was with us had a different uh, kind of attack. I mean, it hit us at the same time. We just kind of both <laughs> each other. But I know I'd received a, when we got upstairs, I had a huge burn on the back of my my head, um, enough to where today it's I can't get hair to grow in that little spot. It scarred me enough that stirred so wow i'm at this point pretty sure i'm done with the house <laughs> <laughs> i don't blame you one i bit. don't i don't think i'm going to get the answers um, right i don't think that there's anything we're going to learn and i i still have and i hear that a lot with demonic hauntings there is a big pull back to the places that it's happened to i don't know why um but i think the best thing i can do is just steer clear and keep my faith up and trust in God, you know, the, to keep me safe. Unfortunately, there, <clears throat> there is a, a connection with, with, if not us, Tony in the house. Um, and I say that because there's a lot of times where there's, there's other investigators over at the house and there, it happens m- most often when they're challenging <clears throat> and, it seems, and we found this out after the fact, we get the repercussions of activity here at the house. You know, things will go flying or fire or, you know, some of those. We still do. And recently it's 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 spread out. We, I can't, we get countless calls and emails of people that have gone there and are now experiencing some really bad trouble in their own homes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems to be a big, a big thing with that house. Um, it's like it, it can, you can go in, you, you may be fine. You, you may experience it. I don't, you know, I don't know, but, uh, they'll tend to almost always experience something within days or, or a week afterwards and really intense things. Um, so, so we always, we warn people we we don't advocate for anybody to go to the house because it it's just waiting for an opportunity. There, I think they're a lot safer how they do it now with their with their tours. I mean, I know Denise is amazing and, and she knows her facts. Um, and she's and she she's, she's also experiencing. So she knows the the risk that's involved and she, and she makes sure that the people that are there are being respectful which probably is a big big um feather in her in her cap that she's not allowing these people to put themselves in danger you know what i mean mm-hmm. well are there any any final thoughts you'd like people to know about your personal experiences there and, and your time in the house Probably just, you know, it, it, it still hurts when people think you make it up. But I, at the same time, I can't blame anybody. Um, I, I know that I would sit, but I was a horrible skeptic. Um, I To this day, I still have trouble fathoming what happened. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't, it's almost like a post-traumatic stress sometimes. Um just be careful. <laughs> That's the biggest thing because honestly, I would, I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go through the things that we've gone through. Um, and, and I don't just mean physically, but the emotional things it can do personally um, to you and, and to each other. And it, if hopefully, if you're a couple, you'll have a strong marriage. We were very lucky that we do. Because we probably wouldn't be together today. Um, and I have to say that our faith in God mm-hmm. um, is probably what protected us and kept us together to this day. I mean, yeah. I mean, a lot of people can 
growl at that. I mean, I know this day and age, you know, it's getting harder and harder. And I know there's believe, a lot of groups out there that don't believe religion has any any place in an investigation. God is there, and He loves us, and, <clears throat> and we're, we're living proof. Had He had He not and not been there for us, we, I, I literally think I'd be in prison now, and Deb wouldn't be here. So, we we count our blessings. Well, thank you so much for all the time you've you've shared with us today. Um, where before we go, where can people go to find information about you or any of your current investigations, uh, any projects you're working on in, in your book? Um, our website is probably the best place, um, which is thesallyhouse.com, and Sally is of course spelled S-A-L-L-I-E. It's the old spelling because it's it was presented as such an old spirit. So, thesallyhouse.com. We try and keep um, a, a, a calendar there and an updated page of, you know, events, things that we're participating in. We actually belong to a group out of St. Louis now and do a lot of fundraising events and investigations <clears throat> with them at some of the, uh, some of the really great old um, locations, uh, Pythian Castle mm-hmm. and Potosi. Uh, Missouri. And we've also teamed up with a uh, another investigator, a very good one, Carissa Fleck, um, and started a group called Survivors of the Dark for anyone. I mean, it, you, if you have a question about the paranormal, you, you can go to our site and we have a website, Survivors of the Dark. Um, ask us. Actually, it's Facebook, Facebook page. Facebook page, everything. Um, but in, anything, I mean, if you're having trouble in the paranormal, need help if we can't help you we'll definitely try to find someone that can um and if you're you know if any of your listeners are wanting to kind of get to uh, kind of want to mingle with us or get to know us a little bit better they can you know uh, look at the uh, paranormal task force website when they list all kinds of um their fundraising events and we're at quite a quite a number of them actually Mm -hmm. Probably 75% of them, yeah. Um, So they can always, you know, get to us to that venue. Of course, there's email, Deborah at the Sally House uh, dot com and Tony at the Sally House dot com. We'll, you know, try our best to get back with you. You can, they can get us on Facebook. There's, if they really want, to get in touch with us. Type in our names. Yeah. (laughs) Probably come up with several. Google our names. We're there. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, I can I can tell you from a personal standpoint, having experienced some things, and nothing like the physical harm that, that you did, but uh, just just having that validation of somebody saying, yeah, this this happens, you know, it's it's very powerful. Uh, so thank right. you for, and, for supporting. And we don't this. want anybody to ever be in that position that we were at, yeah, to, you know, to feel not that lonely, lonely, nowhere to turn yeah, kind of a thing. It's horrible. So we we appreciate your time just as well, so that we can help your listeners or inform your listeners or answer their questions. So we're just as fortunate to have this opportunity. Yeah, we really appreciate you having us on. I want to express a huge thank you to Deborah and Tony Pickman for their openness and transparency during this interview. Before I start recording for these interviews, I usually explain that if I ever ask any questions that are off limits and my guests don't want me to include them in the final podcast, uh, to let me know. They were both very intentional about being willing to answer any questions and that no topic was out of bounds. For a lot of people, going public about experiences like these can alienate you from friends and family. And when people dismiss you outright because they've never had anything similar happen, it certainly doesn't do anything to help the situation. I'm going to be posting all the links that Deb and Tony mentioned on my show notes, which you can find at deviatus.com 22. That's the number 22. If you yourself have been experiencing unexplained phenomena and need someone to speak to about it, or if you need help, they've provided some links for resources that I would encourage you to really check out. I'd like to hear your thoughts about Deb and Tony's story and the entire Sally House series that just ended. And of course, if you've had any experiences with the paranormal, Whether it be ghosts, UFOs, cryptid encounters, or anything just really strange and you'd like to share it with me, please shoot me an email at deviatuspod at gmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at deviatuspod. 
And of course, you can check out the Deviatus Facebook page to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Next week, I'm going to be sitting down with Lorna Adams, who provides psychic readings and helps people connect with their spirit guides. This is a very personal interview that you're not going to want to miss. So thanks for listening and have a great week.